you. So uh, what I want to talk to you about today is uh, mostly just suggest nine reasons why you should throw out all of your online learning courses and replace them with uh, games. And if you're okay with that, um, I just want to get us all on the same page on some language first. Um, I don't want to use the word educational games. I think that's sort of become a moniker for just bad games. I'd rather just talk about games because all games teach something, right? And so um, we'll just, uh, yeah, thanks. We'll just make sure we're talking about games for this. So here we go. Number nine, they give learners uh, choice. So there's been a whole bunch of research from a whole bunch of people showing that uh, choice leads to motivation, which improves the learning experience. And games do a really, really good job of providing choice within parameters for the learners and let them move about how they want to. This is a game called Our Courts, which is great because it allows the learners to choose their line of argumentation in a court case. And this is a real great example of how games can provide lots of open-ended, lots of choice for the learners. Just for the record, this does not uh, count as giving learners <laughs> choice. <laughs> Number eight, it's what Amazon.com would do if they had your job. If your boss came in tomorrow and said, you're all fired, we're outsourcing everything you do to Amazon.com, what they would build would look a lot like an, uh, a game. And the reason is because Amazon totally gets the idea that in order for an experience to be useful, it has to be customized to the needs of the people that are visiting. And you all know that if you've gone to somebody else's computer and gone to Amazon.com, you're like, what is this? Because what you get is customized to them, and you know how important that customization is. Now, with... Um, Online learning, we tend to do a pretty crappy job of this. It, it's sort of kind of like this. Like, well, there's customization for you. And somebody, at some point along the way, is going to say, well, we got learning styles, right? So for kinesthetic learners, feel free to jump up and down while reading this. And now we're really customized, so we're in good shape. But games do a wonderful job of this because they can customize based on your profile. They can customize based on your level. And they can adjust as you go. This online chess game is a great example of that. There's a whole bunch of others uh, as well. Number seven, there are no next buttons. There are two reasons why I absolutely hate next buttons. The first one is that uh, they force us into a very linear mode of, of thinking, right? Do this, then this, then this. And if you don't get number two, you're kind of screwed for number three, four, and five, right? But the other problem is that this just isn't how people think. People actually think a lot more like uh, this. And so one of the things that games do is they allow us to process and move through a learning experience much closer to the way that we actually, uh, we actually think. The other thing is that next button perpetuate this, which I call an abuse of uh, overuse of content, right? This is what I call a nexter. So you have all this content, and we run out of space, we want more content that people aren't going to read, so we throw a next button on the bottom, and we can just do this for pages and pages and pages, right? And games, of course, won't let us do this because uh, we don't use this the next button now. Number six, cognitive psychologists dig it. Um, Andrew Cassessa says the best in instruction hovers at the boundary of a student's competence. There is a, uh, a concept called the zone of proximal development. Basically, it says there's this stuff that I can do, and there's this stuff that I can't do. And in the middle, there's this stuff that I can do with some help. That's the zone of proximal development. And as we learn that stuff, then what we can do on our own increases, and what we can do with help then moves into the area of stuff that we couldn't do at all before. Games are phenomenal at locking people into their zone of proximal development. That's the reason why we want to play games over and over again for hours, because we're right there. If the game is too hard, it moves up into the blue area, people don't want to play it. If it's too easy, what's the point? But if they can hold, it's like riding a wave, and games do a wonderful job of putting people in their uh, zone of proximal development. You know, just try one more time. The first thing you do whenever you lose <laughs> yeah. at, at a level of the game is you hit as fast as you can, you hit the try again button, right? That's because it's, it's holding you right in your zone of proximal development. Number five, sometimes it's good to fail. Um, for some strange reason, we're very failure adverse in learning, and yet it's a wonderful opportunity. It's a great learning opportunity. So this is the famous quote from Thomas Watson, if you want to succeed, double your failure rate. And so I just wanted to do a quick example of two online learning experiences that I had. The first one was taking online algebra, and kind of here's how it went. I tried it, I failed, I got yelled at by my teacher and screwed up my GPA, and as a result I hated math for the rest of my life, pretty much. And so that's one experience. Now that's a failure of course. Failure equals bad in that experience. So let's go over here and take a look at playing plants versus zombies. First time I tried it, I failed. I was rewarded for getting as far as I did in the game and then encouraged to do it again. And the obvious result is that I've spent exaggerated amounts of time playing Plants vs. Zombies until I eventually mastered the game. Uh, this is another screenshot from our courts, and it, it's a great example. I mean, this is a case where I, I put in a, a wrong, uh, I, I incorrectly objected in a, in a line of argumentation. I'm getting railed on here by the judge, but guess what? Next time I do it, I'm not going to make that mistake again. So games really understand how to leverage failure for learning. Number four, it immerses learners in the context. Um, we're, we're really too content heavy in online learning. And so here's an example of what typical online learning does. Here's a shape, here's some instructions about what to do. I can start my movie in the middle of the screen, divide it in half, then move it three inches to the left with a border around each side. This is the, the, the not good approach. Now look at how this looks if we put some context around it, right? So here we go. Here's some context, here's a shape, 
where should I go? You see, just by adding a little bit of context, all of a sudden I don't have to have all that content describing the whole thing, right? And that's what games are so, so good at. This is a game called um, Cellcraft, and it's just great because games put the learners into a role, and as soon as they're in the role, it comes with all that context, and you don't have to say it. It's wonderful. Number three, it gets rid of learners once and for all, and it turns them into problem solvers. This is a game called Fold It. It's a wonderful example of solving real problems. As people play Fold It, they're given protein molecules, and they're asked to fold them, because protein molecules can be uh, folded in all kinds of different, different ways. That's a task that's pretty hard to do computationally. But humans, as it turns out, are actually pretty good at it, because they can imagine it in their mind in 3D, and they can see how it needs to move and shape and change. And so as they go through this game and get points for, for solving these different challenges, these different molecules, it's actually furthering um, scientific research. Number two, they make data sexy. So um, one of the things that's just inexcusable to me in online learning is what we, we, I call post-mortem data, you know? Well, they died. Okay, well, maybe we'll do something about that for the next group. And, and usually it's just something even, even worse, like how long they look at the screen or how many people went through the port. Who cares, right? But games do a great job of making sure that uh, data is sexy. So this is a game that I made for uh, a group uh, in the Indiana School of Business. It's teaching the news vendor principle. And what this does is it has all this cool data. We can see exactly what they're choosing, where they went wrong, how long it took them to figure out a problem. So we can be changing this experience on the fly for them. And also, at the end, they have all this great data. So we know what they're thinking. We can get in their heads a little bit more based on some really cool data. And number one, nobody ever wanted to stay out until 2 a.m. just to take the CBT <laughs> one more time before going to bed. Okay? Let's just face it, um, games are more fun. And there's all kinds of reasons why they're more fun. They're more fun because there's surprises built in, because there's collaboration. But the real reason that games are fun is because fun itself comes from mastery. When we feel like we can master something, it feels fun to us. And that's what games do. They do a wonderful, wonderful job of it. As Ralph Koster put it, in other words, with games, learning is the drug. So what's next? This is a site you can go to innovativelearning.com slash games. This is my site. What I did is I put all the games that I've referenced on today up there so you can go and start playing some games. And as you play them, try to figure out what's making them fun, what makes them work. And there's a whole bunch of other articles and, and things to help you get started uh, making games. So to conclude, there's no learning objective that can't be made into a great game. And there's no learning objective that can't be ruined by turning it into a nexter. There is a, uh, a huge shortage of fun in online learning, and it's our job to fix that. Thank you.